That's not the source of this. God would not say, don't get into rebellion and then create rebellious music. It doesn't make sense. I think the reality is God wants to lift us all out of our earthing cultures to a heavenly one. Amen. So we go to God and say, Lord, forgive me. I made a poor choice. Help me from this moment on to make better ones. Amen. Don't let the devil seduce you. I'd like to welcome you to the fifth presentation of 10. I know it's already been long, but have you learned anything yet? Yes. Praise God. Is it making sense? Yes. Praise the Lord. You know, we're working hard to try to make it clear. And we're, we're getting uh, messages on Facebook of people saying, when they're watching around the world right now, they're saying, this is making sense. We're, we're liking this. And wow, I've even given music seminars and I appreciate what you're saying. So that's really very powerful. Now, something I'd like to address right before we get going is something that's maybe a little bit more of a sensitive issue. And that is, in the previous session, we talked about the African music and its influence upon um, America. Now, what I want you to understand is I myself and those who know me, I don't see color, honestly. And I don't think God's children should see color. Amen? Amen? I don't care if you're black, if you're white, if you're yellow, if you're zebra-striped. It doesn't matter to me. I grew up in a multicultural, non-discriminatory um, environment, and so all of my friends were of all different nationalities. So I don't want you to think that I was down on the blacks. I was simply just referring to the, the plight of the, the African slaves that were brought over here. And so sometimes I may say something or mean a certain way. And for instance, well, one person told me that you said, well, you know, that they were able to have their own churches. Actually, that's not what I did. What I said was that they were finally allowed to have their own churches. And that makes my heart break because a certain race should not be allowed to, to become a Christian. Amen? And so the reality is this is the history. And, and I love my African-American friends. I have many of them. I have many uh, Mexican friends and Latino friends and Asian friends. And so the reality is that God is not against any culture. He's not against any people. Amen. He is for people. However, he's only against things in our cultures that are not of him. And the reality is God wants to lift us out of all of our cultures no matter what it is, an African culture. And frankly, I'll be honest with you, I think the American culture is worse than the African cultures. And I'm an American. <laughs> so I think the reality is God wants to lift us all out of our earthen cultures to a heavenly one. Amen? All right. This particular message is in, entitled The Second Movement. Music's history from 1960 to about 1990. Before we jump into this, I'd like to take us back to the 6th century B.C., and before we do that, we're going to have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity where we can come together and learn these things, whether we've known it before and just having it reinforced, or we're experiencing and, and seeing new things for the first time. Lord, we ask that you would teach us. You would be our teacher. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Su Qing, 6th century BC. He writes, For changing people's manners and customs, there is nothing better than music. In fact, you know what's amazing is that the emperor of China, when the emperor of China wanted to find out what was going on in a certain province of his, of his country, do you know what he would do? He would invite the musicians of that province to come and, and play music in his castle. And the musicians had no idea. They were just thinking, wow, I get to go play for the king. And he knew by the type of music that was being played, whether revolt was going to be incited in that province or if everything was going to be okay. So let me ask you a question. If the emperor of China wanted to hear your music collection, 
would he be nervous of a revolt and rebellion? Or would he say, everything is fine in your home? Do you get the point? What if Jesus said, let's bring up the iPods right now and plug them in, or the iPhones, or whatever device you listen to your music on, and we want to play it for everybody, right here, right now, in public assembly, would we be nervous, or would it be okay? Maybe we should ask that question after tomorrow, right? Because I guarantee you, what I've learned is that almost everybody, myself included, have some changes to make in our, just our music choices. And so if God is convicting you and he's actually bringing you to a place to where you're starting to think, go, wow, you know what, maybe I shouldn't be listening to that. Well, you know, I'm, I shouldn't feel, I'll probably listen to that or whatever. If the Holy Spirit is at work, when should you make the decision to delete it? Right now. And then when do you delete it? Tonight, immediately when you get home. Because you know, you just might not be the same person tonight that you are right now. You're being spirit-led, Holy Spirit-fed, and you're saying, wow, I really want to make these changes. But yet you go home and maybe tomorrow morning or maybe Monday morning, you put it off. Before you know it, the old stinking thinking comes back. Is that true? So you make the choices now. And there's never anything wrong with making the right choice for God. Amen? If you have questions, you're not sure, that's okay. Let it lie. And say, Lord, I open myself up to you to change whatever doesn't please you. Aristotle observed that music directly imitates or represents the passions or states of the soul, gentleness, anger, courage, temperance, and their opposite and other qualities. If over a long time he habitually listens to the kind of music that rouses ignoble, that means dishonorable, base, vile, or unprincipled passions, his whole character will be shaped into an ignoble form. 340 B.C., So what I'm sharing with you is really old information. It just hasn't been distributed very well. Keith Richards, he shared how he received songs. He's a a rocker in the 60s, 70s, and, and 80s. He says, songs, yeah, they think you wrote it. Really, you're just a medium, like being at a seance. They just plop out of the air. Whole songs come to you. You don't write. Songs come to me in mass. I didn't do anything except happen to be awake when it arrived. Um, I do write music, and they don't plop out of the air. It's kind of like J.K. Rowling, who, who wrote the Harry Potter series. She said she was riding on a train, and, and Harry Potter came up and introduced himself to her in her mind's eye, she says. And I knew him immediately. I knew his past, his present, and his future. His present and his future. Why? How? Because it was coming from the devil. And these, these rockers are getting these songs in mass. Morrison of the Doors, Jim Morrison, he said he's actually a, a self-proclaimed shaman, and he's known for his exploration of mysticism through his lyrics. He too said that he received songs in mass, and he would see the whole concert in his head and just write the words to the songs. Crowley is pictured on the cover, excuse me, is pictured on one of their albums as well. Now Crowley has been, Alistair Crowley, has been an influence for a string of popular musicians. And some of the other artists who openly admit in, uh, on top of Jim Morrison uh, that they are Crowley followers, one group was called Iron Maiden, another group Led Zeppelin, David Bowie, Sammy Davis Jr. I didn't hear, and Mick Jagger and Sting. So many of these, these people, and of course Ozzy Osbourne, And many, many more. We're just picking out some large ones. So what happens is these people believe in this. But you know, Aleister Crowley died a long time ago. But there are those who picked up the torch. Anton LaVey picked up Crowley's torch and established the official church of Satan. He wrote the Satanic Bible. And you'll notice back here, you'll notice this symbol back here. It's also on the Satanic Bible. This is actually an occultic symbol. It's actually, you, it's, it's right in here, it's called Baphomet, by the way, which is a goat. You can see the horns up here, the ears coming down, and the chin. 
in an upside down star or pentagram. And you're going to see these goats and these de demonic symbols and the all seeing eye and the pyramids and all the stuff starting to come in as we progress. Anton LaVey promoted a lifestyle of self indulgence. Here's what he say, states desires were meant to be fulfilled. Another statement he has, he says, there's a beast in all of us that needs to be exercised, not exorcised. In other words, he's saying, embrace your beast and make him buffed. In other words, feed the carnal dog and starve the spiritual dog. In the Washington Post, LaVey stated, Satan is a symbol Satan signifies our love of the worldly and our rejection of the pallid, ineffectual image of Christ on the cross. I mean satanic in the sense of a philosophical concept, a, a realm or a state of being that would be best described as a lifestyle, an outlook, an, an attitude. And friends, we are adopting their philosophical views. They think that desires were meant to be fulfilled. They say if anybody comes and starts to take anything from you, destroy them. These are part of their tenets of what they believe. So Crowley's do what thou wilt is the whole of the law is actually the church of Satan's official philosophy and doctrine. So in essence, Anton LaVey is only carrying the torch that Aleister Crowley once lit, which was lit by the prince of fire, if you will, Satan himself. So Satan influences Crowley, Crowley influences Anton LaVey, and therefore the official church of Satan is established. Satanists use a pentagram with the two points up, often inscribed in a double skirt circle, with the head of a goat inside the pentagram. And like I said, this is actually referred to as the sigil of Baphomet. They use it much the same way as the Pythagoreans, as Tartarus, literally translated from the Greek as the pit or void. In Christian terminology, the word is used in such in the Bible, referring to the place where the fallen angels are fettered. The Greek letters are often replaced by Hebrew letters, forming the name Leviathan. So you'll see around here these different letters around the Baphomet symbol here are actually Hebrew, and it means Leviathan. It's a, saint, it's a sign of rebellion, of religious identification, and the three downward points symbolize the rejection of the Holy Trinity, God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So uh, there's so much symbolism in this, and they know exactly what it means. What's sad to me is that there are people that walk around with goat heads on their t-shirts, and some of them even are Christians. They don't even understand these pagan and satanic symbols. Leva uh, LeVay says, let's get them to the place where they forget their logic and just do what thou wilt. We need to get people to where they're not thinking about it anymore. They just do it because it feels good. They want to do it. Frank Zappa, he was quite the rock and roller in his time. In 1968 in Life magazine, he said this, I realized that this music got through to the youngsters because the big beat matched the great rhythms of the body. And I further knew that they would carry this with them for the rest of their lives. The way in which sound affects the human organisms are myriad and subtle. The loud sounds and bright lights of today are tremendous indoctrination tools. You see, they're not just up there having a good time. They're here to indoctrinate, and they want to change our characters. Moving on to the 1970s. Many of the radical ideas of the 60s gained a wider acceptance in the new decade and were mainstreamed into American life and culture. The blatant rejection of Christ was obvious, and the deceptive philosophy of the devil had taken root. Led Zeppelin. Lead man Jimmy Page, a known Crowley aficionado, covened Led Zeppelin for a little bit of soul trading with the devil in an effort to assure their success, in much the same way that blues man 
Robert Johnson had done 40 years prior. Jimmy Page said this, I feel Crowley's a misunderstood genius of the 20th century because his whole thing was liberation of the person, the entity. Restriction would foul you up. What you want to do, do it. I've employed his system in my day-to-day life, and that is the way big names are made these days, not via the press. So what, there's, what he's saying here is in order to be ultimately successful and not just a little blip on the radar of, oh, they were successful for a year or so, but to really have this tremendous staying power and be amazingly successful in the industry, the music industry, the entertainment industry, the way big names are made according to those who are big names is that you make a deal with the devil. That's what he just said. Not via the press. It's not if you throw enough money at it. It's because you make a deal with the devil. Have you ever wondered, how did that guy or how did that girl, how are they even that big? They don't even sing that well. Have you ever thought that? Well, gee, I wonder. Didn't say talent required. It just said, be my loyal subject and I'll make you something, the devil said. That's all. You know, here's another thing. The devil's only going to allow those that he believes will be his greatest evangelist and not turn their back on him. So he doesn't bless everybody with all of this. He takes the ones that are going to be his special tools that he knows he's got them hook, line, and sinker. And then he'll sink a lot of money, invest a lot of time in those people to grow them. Does that make sense? Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven. The most requested rock song of all time was hailed as one of the greatest satanic works ever. Robert Plant, a member of the group, he said he was given the song by automation. Have you seen a thread here? That a lot of these big bands, big groups and and massive stars have been given this stuff by automation. It just comes to them. They hear it, they see it, and they write it down, and it's done. Is that inspiration coming from God? You shall know them by their fruits, friends. And if the music is leading you to drugs and alcohol, premarital sex, and, and, and uh, just a flippant attitude of, of lack of responsibility and rebellion, that is not of God. Amen? That's not the source of this. God would not say, don't get into rebellion and then create rebellious music. It doesn't make sense. The Beach Boys. Round, round, get around, I get around, yeah, get around, round, round, I get around, I get around, get around, round, round, I get around. There's the same polyrhythmic element. And when I found this, I was like, are you kidding me? Because I tell you what, I used to really like the Beach Boys. I'm thinking, I get around, you know, and it's talking about muscle cars and girls and surfing and all this kind of stuff, you know. And I used to really, because I'm a convert, you have to understand, I wasn't raised in a church. I'm a convert, and so I listened to a lot of junk, as I uh, mentioned on the first meeting that we had. And the fact is, I, I used to love this kind of music because it was just kind of fun and a little more happy. And then I, as a Christian, as we started investigating all this and I heard that clip, I'm like, oh, I get around? Do you think he's talking about cruising? No, he's, he's talking about I'm making a lot of inappropriate choices with women and I get around. And I started thinking about, wow, I just used to sing that song and and I guess what happened was I started to get around myself. Just being honest with you, because by beholding, you are what? Changed. Brian Wilson, who was the musical, considered the musical genius behind the Beach Boys, here's what he said himself. Now, what you just heard is this is what he describes We were doing witchcraft, trying to do witchcraft music. I was like, oh! I was like, is nothing sacred? You know what I mean? I was like, uh, even the Beach Boys are involved in this. I get in the down, now, 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 now. I was like, even that was witchcraft music? Well, sure, because it's like candy that's 
coated over the poison, right? Yeah, if I walked up to you and said, here, this is poison, drink it, it'll kill you. How many of you go, oh, thanks? Of course not. But what if I came up to you and go, oh, man, you got to try that candy. That's awesome. Oh, really? Ah, that looks good. Oh, by the way, that's poison. What? So that's what the devil does. The devil sugarcoats his poison. In fact, the devil sugarcoats his witchcraft. The devil sugarcoats his occultic themes. The devil sugarcoats do what thou wilt. It's just a lot of fun. You're being too fanatical, Christian. No, I'm not. Because there's a battle going on for our souls. But beyond doing witchcraft and trying to do witchcraft music, something else is very interesting. With the Beach Boys, they would take the same shaman as the Beatles, to indoctrinate the crowds during and after their concerts. So you have this guy teaching this Eastern mysticism, which is totally a, an inappropriate religion. It, it, it's absolutely pagan, and it's linking us with occultic uh, symbology sometimes and with pagan gods and demons. And yet the Beach Boys would say, all right, now we've got a message for you, and they go off and let the Maharishi come up and indoctrinate the crowd, and they would accept it because their prefrontal cortex was, eh, right? And if they were doing anything else like drugs and alcohol, it was even more impaired. Brian Wilson, that's the genius behind the Beach Boys, later claimed that he believed himself to be possessed. David Bowie. Now this is interesting. <clears throat> Listen to his music. get that whole now would this be in a club sure maybe not today but sure as opposed to Mozart right now here's what he himself says rock has always been the devil's music okay so <laughs> if the rock and roller is saying rock has always been the devil's music then what are we as Christians even doing touching it I believe rock and roll is dangerous. I feel we are only heralding something even darker than ourselves. You see, all of these clips so far have been rock and roll, even though they've had varying kinds of sounds. Rock and roll is not just Kiss, Def Leppard, Zeppelin, and all those. The common theme that links all these pieces and makes them forms of rock is the dominant rhythm section minimizing the melody. Remember that flipping over of how God had created music to be? John Denver, this is interesting, he's a country folk artist, he said this, rock music is a greater influence over the souls of men than primitive Christianity. Why? The beats. So everybody in the industry sees it, but sometimes we don't want to. And he was well known for this particular song. Sunshine on my shoulders makes me happy. So not all secular music is bad. There's nothing wrong with this song. So we're not saying all secular music is out. We need to acquire a toolbox that helps us to know what helps us and what can hinder us. And so... I listen to some different secular pieces. I listen to some, in fact, not all classical, by the way, but spiritual. There's secular uh, uh, classical, and that's a large categorization of everything that seemed to come from Europe, even though that's not a proper classification, but that's what we all call it. The reality is that there are many secular pieces that are actually okay. If it's not drawing me away from God, then there's nothing wrong with that. Amen? People don't want to hear that sometimes, but that's the reality. If it doesn't violate certain biblical principles, which we're going to get to in the coming messages, then it's fine. But that doesn't mean that everything that, for instance, John Denver sings or plays is acceptable as well. 
because he has other melodies and rhythms and percussive things and multi, the polyrhythmic elements in some of his songs. So just because a, uh, one singer or group has a great song doesn't mean we could listen to everything, right? I am thankful for places like iTunes now to where I don't have to buy an entire album and spend $20 just to get one song. I can go and listen to samples, and fortunately now the samples are even longer, which is great. It used to be this little 30-second clip, but now you can listen to many of them over a minute, and you can really get an idea, is this song acceptable or not? Sometimes you still get nailed, and you, you wasted a buck or two, but it's better than 20, right? So we, put, we, have a very, we have a lot of artists on our iPhones and iPods, but they may only be like one or two songs from each, even in, in the Christian world, because frankly, I listen to... Pretty much, pretty much, like 98%, 99% of everything I listen to is spiritual. Because there's just not a lot out there that is secular, that's okay. That's, but there, is, there, there are some. Satan worked heavily through the hippie age of the 60s and 70s, slipping in destructive teachings undermining traditional moral values under the cloak of a supposed anti-materialistic peace movement. It promised a higher spiritual place through the same voodoo practices of sex, drugs, and music, or as we would say, rock and roll. According to Timothy Leary, remember he was the, the Harvard professor, the 60s were what he called a revelation of the glory of what Aleister Crowley had started. So they, there, there's this whole this, these people look at the, these Crowley followers and see the trend of how it was shaping America's values and it was shaping the world because so goes America, so goes the world. And so all these people were embracing do what thou wilt. They're smoking pot, they're having orgies, doing all this stuff together that's inappropriate. And, and Leary sees it all and he goes, oh, the 60s were just a revelation of the glory of what Alistair had started. <laughs> So what exactly did living by the satanic doctrine of do what thou wilt actually start? Well, since the 1960s to the 1980s, this will astonish you. Suicide rose 400%. Unwed couples living together rose 536%. Pregnancy among girls from 10 to 14 rose 553%. Prior to 1960, there were only two sexually transmitted diseases. Today, there are now more than 25. So free love gave us a whole bunch of nastiness. And violent crimes rose 900%. 95%. When you listen to angry music, you become angry. When you listen to sexual music, you become sexual. When you listen to rebellious music, you become rebellious. I don't care if it has Christian lyrics on it or not. Because the music has the message. We've been told that over and over again. I hope that is a clear point. Christian contemporary music. Now, in the late 70s, CCM, or Christian Contemporary Music, officially began. Now, this first song, here's what happened. The CCM artists heard the same kind of music that was going on in and around their areas here in America, and sometimes things are regionalized, but the reality is that they were hearing what's going on in the secular music and thought, wow, I think we should make that kind of music, but just put Christian lyrics on it. So this is really the birth of CCM right here in the 1970s. And this particular song is called Rock and Roll Preacher. Does that sound like 70s music? Absolutely. And then, here's another song. Loves you like a rock. Now, this is interesting. My wife listened to this song as she was growing up. 
she didn't know it was Christian. Do you want to know why? If you get this, this will change your thinking about Christian music. Because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. What's a rock to a secular mind? It's not Jesus Christ, because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. In fact, what's amazing is when we were putting this seminar together and Kobe heard the song, she was like, oh, I never knew that was a, a Christian song. Yet she knew all the lyrics. And the moment it started playing, she could sing the whole song. Boom. Why? Everything's perfectly recorded. But you know what? It did her no spiritual benefit until the Holy Spirit was in her life to give her the spiritual discernment. So the greatest argument in Christian music is this. Well, we're trying to cross over in the secular world because we want to win people to Jesus. Friends, without the Holy Spirit, there is no crossing them back over to us. Because they don't get it. <sighs> yeah, they like the beat. Liked how it made you feel. And here's the song. When I was a little boy, I was just a boy. And the devil would call my name. I was just a boy. I'd say, who do, who do you think you're fooling? When I was just a boy. I'm a consecrated boy. When I was just a boy. So she knew all this music, but she's not sitting there going, oh, yeah, man. No, it's just she liked the groove of it and liked the beat of it. And so the reality is if our music, the Christian music, is going out there around the world, friends, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but we can't think that because they heard our Christian song that it's going to convert their souls because you have to be a willing participant in that. Does that make sense? All right. 1980s. The music in the early 80s was in a state of flux. The music of Elvis, the Beatles, the Doors, Ozzy Osbourne was all known under the same name, rock and roll, even though the styles of the music were very different. By the time the 80s hit, disco was established and rock splintered into more defined categories, rock, excuse me, soft rock, hard rock, pop rock, country rock, to name just a few. The root of all of these genres at the core is still the same thing. Rock and roll, they're just hybrids, we call them. Originally R&B or rhythm and blues from jazz. Joachim Brent says this in his book, The Jazz Book. Taking an active interest in jazz means working for a majority because the popular music of our time feeds on jazz. Now remember, we talked about this starting back with ragtime and then a little bit of that jazz and, and well, I better not go there. Jazz, and then it got into R&B, and it got into um, rock and roll, and it continued to progress into all these different splintered types of genres. But the root of it all is rock and roll, and the root of rock and roll is jazz. And the root of jazz was voodoo. All the music we hear in TV series and on Top 40 radio, in the hotel lobbies, on the elevators, in commercials, and in movies, all the music to which we dance, from the Charleston to rock, funk, disco, all those sounds that daily engulf us, all that music comes from jazz because beat came to Western music through jazz. The experts get it. Mickey Hart, drummer for the Grateful Dead, this is one of their popular songs. Now, it's not crazy. You could hear the guiding pulse, keeping time, and the multi-layers of sounds coming in and out, but it's not hard rock. Now, one of the challenges of playing secular songs, especially now that we get into genres or, excuse me, ages that are closer to most of us in this room, is it could call up different memories for you. And just pray against that if they're not godly ones, okay? But we need to continue down this vein. And I apologize, Krista. <laughs> Here's what he said. He has studied drums and their power all over the world. He is a known and respected expert on drums. And here's what he states. Everywhere you look on the planet, people are using drums to alter consciousness. That's the point. 
drumming inappropriately alters consciousness. We may not want it. No, no, that's not true. But yes, it is. Whether we like it or not doesn't change that. Amen. Amen? I have discovered, along with many others, the extraordinary power of music, particularly percussion, to influence the human mind and body. There have been many times that I have felt that the drums have carried me to an open door to another world. Oh, he's right, as we've discovered already. It's hard to pinpoint the exact moment when I awoke to the fact that my music, my tradition rock and roll, did have a spirit side. That there was a branch of the family, the voodoo branch, if you will, the pagan branches around the world, if you will. There was a branch of the family that maintained the ancient connection between the drum and the gods. He is one of the most respected drum drummers and studiers of drumming, in the world, and he's saying there's a serious spirit side here. There's a connection between the gods, and of course, we would know that as Christian as the demons because there is only one God. In an article entitled High Tech in the Low Frequencies, DJ is actually reporter Jason Sneed wrote about the huge club DJ scene, and here's what he says about one DJ. DJ Lauren, a.k.a. Bass Nectar, he represents the wave of DJ success, playing amazing sets to dance floors throughout North America and beyond. Bass Nectar's shows have the future primitive feel of all-out revelry resulting from the tribal unity of audience involvement. And that was quite a sentence. And what it's saying is, this is getting to be real tribal, and it causes everybody to have some unity in the clubs. Now, I'm going to play a, uh, I'm going to play a clip for you. Now, you'll remember this particular clip. Now, this is going to amaze you. This was original voodoo that we played earlier. You remember that clip, maybe? Okay. So, while we're putting this together, I thought to myself, actually, I shouldn't say that. The Lord impressed me. And he said, Christian, I want you to take that voodoo clip that you heard before because it's very similar to this one. Because this is Bass Nectar's popular music in the dance clubs. So what he said was, why don't you put it in your, your software? I have a software, a, a software program that I use called Pro Tools, and, and you can put different tracks in there. So I have one track playing this voodoo clip. He said, bring in the other track and put them on top of each other. And guess what? They matched up perfectly. It was unbelievable to me. Old voodoo! And it's like the modern day things that we're dancing to in the clubs or listening to in our cars or in our iPods or, God forbid, in the church. So imagine my surprise when I heard this, and I'll point when the voodoo drums come in. Same thing. Same thing. Just has a different candy coating. The devil is playing for keeps, my friends, and he's been in the music industry a long time. The beats minister to the flesh, the carnal, not the spiritual. And in the 80s, as the, and continuing on in the 80s, there was more sensual themes than ever. Disco time, towards the end of the 70s, was transitioning into the 80s. And this is where dancing came heavily on the scene. And dance music was big. And with the launch of new, this new MTV network, it brought the effects of music to an entirely new level. Musicians now had a new forum to exhibit an even stronger influence because now they could engage not just one sense, but a second sense now. The more senses involved, the more powerful the impression that is made. And a lady who definitely has had an influence in this world is none other than Madonna. Notably, one of the top artists, she found immense popularity starting in the 80s by pushing the sensual boundaries in mainstream music and with 
provocative imagery in her videos. She quickly became an icon in dress, in attitude, and in behavior. Her title track, Like a Virgin, didn't say she was, it says I'm like one, don't quite know what that means, but Like a Virgin attracted attention of family organizations who complained that the song and its video promoted premarital sex. Same polyrhythmic elements. And she really accentuated the sensuality. Papa Don't Preach and all these other songs where she's talking about that she got pregnant out of wedlock and all these kinds of things. Papa, don't preach to me. I'm going to do my own thing. And so this began to be programmed in little girls all across the country. And they began to idolize this young woman. She came under further fire when she performed the song for the first MTV Video Music Awards, where she appeared on stage in this lingerie-styled wedding dress with her characteristic boy toy belt on. She proceeded to sing and roll around on the floor sensually. The critics and media loved her. She boasted, it was the bravest, most blatant sexual thing I'd ever done on television. Biographer Andre Morton commented, here was a woman who dressed wantingly and behaved badly, yet who, far from being punished for her behavior, was instead richly rewarded. She started going forward with the devil's philosophy of do what thou wilt. Go and do whatever you want to do. Sing about the things that you want to sing about. And all these young people will be released and relinquished to go out, released to go out and do whatever they want to do. And you'll have a following. You'll be rich, my young daughter. And she bought in hook, line, and sinker. Just as the 60s and 70s had adopted the philosophy of do what thou wilt with the slogan of do your own thing, well, in the 80s, they did the same thing. They just altered it to live and let live. Have you heard these phrases? It's the same satanic philosophy, and it flies right in the face of our dear Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And Madonna became one of the strongest promoters of this ideology. Sadly, for all of her praise popularity, she was not a happy, peaceful person, as is, in, is the case with the majority of artists. In the Los Angeles Times, in an interview, she shared, I'm a tormented person. I have a lot of demons inside of me. My pain is as big as my joy. So living this life, the lie that you can do whatever you want to do, is not leading to happiness and joy, my friends. Oh, you may, might make your bank account fat, but friends, that doesn't make a happy life. By the end of the 80s, Madonna was the most successful artist of the decade, and she was only surpassed by none other than Michael Jackson known as the king of pop. He suffered under the bondage of Satan as well. Though he publicly claimed to have no involvement with the occult, his life was shadowed by the darkness that only comes from the enemy. Unfortunately, what the devil started to do in the 80s was now to mask the occult. He kind of went underground for a little while. And he masked the occult in more acceptable forms and terminology. For instance, Aleister Crowley had a secret room with mirrors where he practiced his black magic and contacted demonic beings. In an interview, Michael Jackson said, I have my own secret room with moving walls and mirrors. That's where I talk to Liberace. He is the voice I hear in there. I feel his presence so very close to me. He's talking about a dead artist. You know Liberace, the piano player? They were friends, and he had the same kind of room as Aleister Crowley with moving mirrors and all this, and he would talk to dead people. Have you ever seen this cover? This is of, of Michael Jackson's Dangerous album, and you can sit and look at this literally for hours, and you find new things in it, and it looks like this massive happy carnival, but it's behind it all are the eyes of Michael Jackson. And yet you look at this symbology, and I, I started kind of just looking at it, and I'm wondering, I don't know, but if you look in here, it, it, out here it's all it, glamour and glitzy and wonderful, and strangely enough, you have all these animals coming in, and as they come out, there's skeletons and they're dead, and they're coming out under this all-seeing eye over here, which is an occultic sat satanic symbol, and then you have 
Um, inside here, everything is black and grayed out and nasty, and the world is actually turned upside down, and everything's coming out in these little bits and pieces. It's like, what I'm wondering if he's saying, everything looks fine and dandy on the outside, but inside my world is turned upside down. I'm a prisoner. I can't get free. Is that what he's saying? There's darkness inside. I don't know, but there's a lot there. And he's talking to dead people. He also shared, I wake up from dreams and go, wow, put this down on paper. The whole thing is strange. You hear the words. Everything is right there in front of your face. And you say to yourself, I'm sorry, I just didn't write this. It's there already. I feel that somewhere, someplace, it's all been done. And I'm a courier bringing it into the world. Automation? About his concerts, he says, when I hit the stage, it's all of a sudden a magic from somewhere that comes and the spirit just hits you and you lose control of yourself. During an Oprah Winfrey interview, Michael Jackson explained the reason for some of his filthy sexual gestures during his concerts. And friends, I, st I used to love Michael Jackson. I used to dance like Michael Jackson. I used to moonwalk and, ooh, and all the stuff that he would do. And in fact, I look back at it now and I go, man, that guy was grabbing his crotch and doing all this stuff right there in front of all these little kids. And I was one of the little kids going, oh, I want to do that too. Ooh. Unbelievable. So I just became a little Michael Jackson follower, becoming an Al Aleister Crowley follower, and I didn't even know it. Do what thou wilt. But that's how the devil works. Now, why are we going over this? Because, friends, you're tuning your ears right now and you don't even realize it because when we jump into CCM, you're going to go, that's the same stuff. Exactly. It happens subliminally. It's the music that compels me to do it. You don't think about it. It just happens. I'm a slave to the rhythm. I was wondering. You could keep on because the force has it, got a lot of power in it. Do you hear a motive in the song? In the music? It, it makes me feel like that. <laughs> right? You got the everything. That, in fact, when you listen to Michael Jackson's music, it is among the most polyrhythmic I have ever heard. You put on earphones, it is going on everywhere. And they even switch it from ear to ear and up and down. It is incredible. I, got, I was like, <gasps> I, I took it off. I was like, whoa, and my, my hands were trembling. I, was, I know exactly what that is. Why do you think he was the king of pop? Because he, had, he was tapped into the power of the polyrhythmic voodoo rhythm. Music is the idol which many professed Christians worship. Satan has no objection to music if he can make that a channel through which to gain access to the minds of the youth. Anything will suit his purpose that will divert the mind from God. He works through the means which will exert the strongest influence to hold the largest numbers in pleasing infatuation while they are paralyzed by his power. The Philadelphia Inquirer, now this is pretty amazing. When being interviewed, the president of MTV, Music Television, said this. He said, the strongest appeal you can make is emotionally. If you get their emotions going, make them forget their logic, prefrontal cortex, you've got them. At MTV, we don't shoot for the 14-year-olds, we own them. You see, they get it. They know that they're actually serving up something that makes us want more of it, and they've got a captive audience. This is very serious, my friends. We could be letting our children listening listen to something that could be actually turning off their spiritual discernment, their very reasoning powers, short-circuiting their more the frontal moral device. This is dangerous. Would you agree? And so for six days a week in our life, we can't go switching off our frontal moral lobes and then flip it on for the Sabbath and go, oh, everything's going to be okay. There's a message out there called Six Days in Babylon. I encourage you to get it because it talks about this very thing. 
It's free. Take them. Go give them to your friends. I don't want to take any back. They're already packaged up. Take them. You want two or three or five? Take them. Go give them to your friends. Listen to it first. If you agree with it, then hand it out. Amen? Because it's talking about being like Jesus for six days a week so we can worship Jesus on the seventh day. As opposed to being like the devil for six days a week and barely able to keep our eyes open in church on the seventh day. So, what were the top five problems in school in the 1940s? What do you think the number one problem in school was? How about running in the halls? I mean, those crazy kids. Number one, if we could just solve this problem back in the 1940s, brother so-and-so or however they referred to each other, if we could just stop these young people from running in the halls, life would be better. Tardiness was the number two problem. Spitwads in class was number three. Missing the garbage can was number four. Young man, pick up that garbage. Oh, okay. Today, it's like, pick up that garbage. No, ba 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 bam you know, anyway. <laughs> number five, chewing gum. So these are the top five problems in the 1940s. How about the 1980s? 40 short years later. 40 years of Crowleyan philosophy. That's all. Just 40 years. Number one, murder. Number two, theft. Number three, rape. This is high school. Number four, drugs. Number five, alcohol. I think I would have liked to live in the 40s rather than the 80s. And I lived in the 80s. Now, in the 1980s, contemporary Christian music. Again, let's listen real quick to get an idea of what some of the top CCM songs were from the 80s. Now, tell me that this doesn't sound like something from the 80s. It's called, I Want to Be a Clone. No, I'm sorry. Uh, first one is, Ready or Not. So a twinkling of an eye, there'll be Jesus in the sky, ready or not. Does that sound like 80s? And that's so 80s. You know what that is? That is rad. No, it's not. It's just kidding. <laughs> now, here's the other one. I want to be a clone. Is next to right. I'm grateful that they showed the way because I could never know the way to serve him on my own. So what we're doing is we're co-opting what's popular and putting, frankly, ridiculous lyrics on it. But that's Christian music. Mm, no, it's not. It's called that. Moving into the 1990s. More choices than ever were available in music. With all the diversity, though, there were three fundamental things they all had in common. The do-what-thou-wilt philosophy overtly sexual content, and heavily accentuated beats and rhythms. In addition to this, homosexuality now begins to be pushed, and grunge took over heavily in the early part of the decade. And with the band Nirvana at its head, we can see the same spirit working. Kurt Cobain, the lead singer of Nirvana, and this is, they were a grunge band in the 1990s, he said it was his personal goal to get stoned and worship Satan. And his reports reported that he was obsessed with Anton LaVey. And I'm, I'm sad to say that I actually used to listen to this band and I used to really like it. In fact, I was for a while a photographer with one of the companies that I had. And I would crank up this music and be taking all these photos of these models and things going on. And, and it was you had to have certain kinds of music going on to get those provocative photos. And I'm, I'm not proud of that, but that was the reality. And we'd sit there and go, and just have them working. And I loved it. And I would just get into it. And it took over. And I'm not proud of that. Into the, the late 90s, LaVey is still alive and well, which means Crowley is alive and well. 
Or better yet, the devil is still alive and well, and his ideals are still alive. In Spin Magazine, that group we just listened to, Nirvana, was called the Band of the Decade. Now, you would look at this and go, well, of course, that was satanic, that's evil music, you shouldn't be listening to that. But would you look at this face and think there would be anything wrong, to anything to consider that would be inappropriate? Well, she has a song, and let me just play it for you. Every day I crucify myself Very popular song. So you have this song where he's talking about I'm, being, I'm sick of being in chains and all this kind of stuff. Why do we crucify ourselves when well, nothing that we do is ever good enough for you? And so she's talking about being a Christian apparently and that, that it's, it's a, a, a uh, trapped kind of life, a chain-bound life. But it's done in this, -na 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 -na, and people go, oh, I really like that. Yeah, why am I crucifying myself? Oh, what is she saying? Oh, do what thou wilt, right? And then she has another song entitled, Father Lucifer. <laughs> and she says this, I wanted to marry Lucifer. I don't consider Lucifer an evil force. I feel his presence with his music. I feel like he comes and sits on my piano. <laughs> no, thank you. Amen? So you look at her face and you're thinking, you know, you look at these other guys, they're like smoking pot, they're all, uh, and you're like, oh, Satanist. But then we have this girl going, I love, I want to marry Lucifer. So don't think that the devil has the pitchfork and horns and a red costume that he wears, okay? The devil is a fallen angel, and he exceeds in beauty, something that where if you walked in this room right now, we'd all go, oh! And so he uses the grungy, and he uses the beautiful. So you can't judge a book by its cover. How about this face? Anybody ever heard of Sarah McLaughlin? A lot of young ladies listen to this girl's music. I wouldn't doubt that some in this room listen. Now, this first music clip sounds beautiful. It talks about an angel. It talks about being in the arms of an angel. It sounds like she could be a Christian. And it's actually a pretty song. In this sweet couple things in the vocal technique that we'll get into later, but would you think, listening to that song in the arms of the angel, would you think of that song as a song of Satan? Well, you're wrong. She's talking about not an arms of an angel. She's talking about the arms of the angel. Just watch. And then she has, we'll get to that in just a moment, because she has a quote where she talks about something. And then she has this song. So here's what happens, and it really drives me nuts. These girls or these guys, these artists out there, release something beautiful like that. It gets lots of radio play, and even in Christian circles. And so we have these young people that go, oh, that's so beautiful in the arms of the angel. That's so amazing, so wonderful. I can't believe that. And I want, Mom, listen to that song. Wow, that's beautiful. Who's that? Oh, that's Sarah McLaughlin. Oh, okay, great. Can I get some more of her music? Well, sure, go ahead, honey. Oh, wow, that's great. Sounds like she's a Christian. And then in, in her music repertoire, we have a song like this where she rips God apart. Don't believe in heaven or hell, no saints, no sin, no devil as well, no perfect gates, no funny crowd. You're always letting us humans down. The walls you break, the babes you drown, those lives you see and never found. It's all the same, the whole world. So 
she talks about, I don't believe in no pearly gates, no thorny crowns. You're always letting us humans down. The babies you drown. And, and she just goes and she's ripping God apart. Did the music, by the way, match that anger? Yeah. Now here's what she said. I think the devil has gotten a bad rap. The devil is the, I'm sorry, the what? The fallen angel. She understands who the angel was. And she wants to be in the arms of the fallen angel. Here's what she says. The devil has gotten a bad rap. The devil is the fallen angel, the one who was willing to embrace his dark sides, whereas all the other angels were in total denial. The devil is more like us. She was singing in the arms of the angel, the fallen angel. And our Christian kids are sitting here listening to it because it's pretty. It's sugar-coated poison. In Crowley's book, Magic Without Tears, he writes this, family is public enemy number one. He wants to destroy the nuclear family. He wants to destroy mommy, daddy, and children. He wants it to be mommy and mommy or daddy and daddy. He wants to be anything else but the nuclear family that God has set up, and he wants to destroy it. Has he been doing a good job? <laughs> Tearing down the biblical image. And then public assaults were everywhere. Madonna's influence not only bred materialism and sexual promiscuity, but in the 1990s, she brought her fans into spiritualism and the occult with an intrigue of homosexual behavior. And you're going to notice here some occultic symbols. Now, this one is disgusting to me because here she is on a crucifix and she is in a red top symbolizing the blood. Now, is she doing that because she's a Christian? No, she's mocking Christianity. And here she is with an occultic symbol as well. What does that mean, by the way? A-OK? -okay? No, it means 666. Six, six. Six, six, six. It's an occultic symbol. She's not going, you know, like, hey, it's A-OK. -okay. She's going, I'm going to eat your lunch, boy. That's what she's saying. So we walk around, we're flashing occult signs, we don't even know it. There's gonna, you're going to start seeing a whole bunch of this in the 2000s. And then she's wearing this symbol right here, this triangle, this pyramid with the all-seeing eye at the top. And this is also occultic imagery. Harry Hay, a Crowleyan Satanist and the founder of the modern homosexual movement. Yes, that's a man. He said... This language, music, has the power to communicate ideas, plan, and issues through the form of songs and dances under the noses of the authorities. So he knows he can use music, and the homosexual agenda can be pushed forward through music, and that's why we're starting to see all of this sexual homosexual imagery all over MTV. Music always had the power to inspire revolt and revolution. To two-thirds of the world today, music is a language, a method of communicating, organizing, and mobilizing. And let me tell you, the homosexual agenda is organized, communicating, and they're mobilizing. I'll tell you that right now. So we will see this to be true as we continue on. Now, let's look at these lyrics for a moment. And what do you think about these lyrics when you look at them? Your own personal Jesus, someone to hear your prayers, someone who cares. Is there anything wrong with those lyrics? No. Jesus wants to be our own personal Jesus. Amen? Someone that will hear our prayers. Someone who cares. That indeed is God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son. Amen? There's nothing wrong with those lyrics. Now, let's take a listen to a music clip. Your own personal Jesus Someone to hear your prayers Someone who cares Okay, so is there anything wrong with that music? Oh, there is? Oh, you're being, you're educated. Praise the Lord. Yeah, because the music bed didn't match the lyrical content, right? 
Right, okay. So it's a house divided against itself. It can't stand. So the challenge is, we could say, no, I'm making music in my heart to the Lord. My heart belongs to the Lord. I've got good lyrics. I'm just playing the music the way that I want to. But friends, the problem is, even beyond all of this, now see, if I had put someone's nice little picture up there, and they're in a little suit, and they're in their little tie, and they have, you know, nice hair and everything, and they're going, and they sang that song, you'd go, wow, that guy sang that? But when I put Marilyn Manson's picture on there, you go, oh, he sang that song. Oh, that's evil. Are you following here? Because we could use the same exact music bed with those lyrics by a Christian band, and we would say it's okay. But not Marilyn Manson because he's of the devil. Well, guess what? The devil serves up two plates. Right? That's right. In fact, that was just a remake of the 80s Depeche Mode release. It's not a Christian band, and those were not intended as Christian lyrics. Lyrically, it sounds like a Christian song. So if the lyrics only matter argument stood, then we could be able to listen to it. If my heart's for God, then I can attribute all of this music to Christ, and it's acceptable now for me. We have no problem saying no to this. How hypocritical is it of us as parents to say that our young people cannot listen to Marilyn Manson, but they could listen to a Christian version of Marilyn Manson? It doesn't make sense. And this is why some of the Christians are going, you know what, you just don't make any sense, Mom and Dad. Because if it's not okay for Marilyn Manson to play that music and for me to listen to it, then why is it okay for me to have the Christian version of it? All we've done is baptized paganism. Marilyn Manson is an ordained reverend in the Church of Satan. Mutilates himself on stage, rips up the Holy Bible, spews blasphemies against the Lord Jesus Christ, and Manson t-shirts declare, kill your parents and I love Satan. So why talk about this guy? Because friends, when we sent out our Facebook request, hey guys, you Christian kids, you Adventist kids, what are you listening to? we had far too many respondents say, I listen to Marilyn Manson. I'm telling you, it's the truth. Why are we talking about them? Because maybe our young people are listening to him, or maybe our dorm, dorm mates or our roommates are listening to him, or our friends are listening to him, and they're wanting to introduce our children to him. There is a strange fascination with this guy. He has a t-shirt, by the way, that he sells, and it says this on it, and this is a picture of the, of the t-shirt. Warning, the music of Marilyn Manson contains messages that will kill God in your impressionable teenage mind. As a result, you could be convinced to kill your mom and dad. And eventually, in an act of hopeless rock and roll behavior, you will kill yourself. Please, burn your records while there's still hope. Kids buy this thinking it's hysterical, and they put it on and wear it around because Marilyn Manson mocks people like me that say this is a problem. The reality is, my friends, Marilyn Manson, Manson is just a disciple of the devil. He is well-funded, and he holds evangelistic crusades all the time. They just happen to be called concerts. <clears throat> but it's just music, isn't it? Well, he's quoted as saying this. Music is the strongest form of magic. Does he have an agenda? <laughs> I don't know if anyone has really understood, this is a direct quote, what we are trying to do to lure people in. And once we've got them, we can give them our message. Hopefully, he says, I'll be remembered as the person who brought an end to Christianity. Here's another quote. If somebody kills themselves because of our music, then that's one less stupid person in the world. Raise your kids better, or I'll be raising them for you. That should send chills up and down a parent's spine, because they get it. Here's what happens. Little Junior, little Missy, they want to listen to certain kinds of music. Mom and Dad are afraid of making Junior mad or upset, so they let him because they don't want to make a problem in the household 
And so it starts off with maybe the soft rock, and then it goes to the harder rock, and then it goes to crazy rock, and then it goes into satanic rock and roll. And before you know it, you don't even have your child anymore, and you wonder what's going on. And the parents come to me and say, what do I do? Well, you put them on a detox. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow afternoon. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Listen, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's exactly what's happening. Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They're out there impressing our minds, changing our characters with this whole do what thou wilt. Who cares what the pastor says? Who cares what my wife says? Who cares what my parents says? Who cares what my boss says? I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And that's not a recipe for success, friends. It's a recipe for failure. Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Don't listen to their music. Don't let them serenade you to hell. But what if I have, Christian? What if I've been listening to this stuff? Well, guess what? Today's a new day then, if we choose to turn from it. Because in Romans 8, 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Jesus Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And so, friends, if we decide, yes, I've made some decisions that are inappropriate. We realize that. I have made decisions that are inappropriate. And if we don't take action and say, Lord, please forgive me for my poor choices and help me to make better ones, then we're, nothing's going to change in our life. You know what the definition of insanity is, right? It's doing the same thing over and over and over, expecting different results. How many times Christians come up to us and say, I just don't feel like you know, I'm connected to God. I just don't feel like my prayers go above the, the ceiling in my, my house. and I just, There's just no connection there. And then I begin to ask them questions about their daily life. I begin to ask them, what types of things do you engage in? What do you listen to? How much Bible study time do you have? How much time are you spending in the Bible and spirit of prophecy? How, many, how much time are you doing? How, and then you start to realize that the time that we spend with God is actually down here, and the time we spend with the world and the devil is up here. No wonder there's no connection. But God says, look, if you walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, there'll be no condemnation. I'll forgive you. It's okay. So we go to God and say, Lord, forgive me. I made a poor choice. Help me from this moment on to make better ones. Amen. Don't let the devil seduce you. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you are willing to accept us. You're willing to take us. You know the deep, dark secrets of our heart, and yet you still love us and choose us. So, Father, I give you my yes. Yes, Lord, take my mind. Take my heart. It's yours. Shape it and mold it the way that you want, and help me to stop up my ears and not listen to the things of the devil anymore. And hopefully some of my friends have prayed that prayer with me. And Father, I pray that you would please bless us. And I know as we depart from this place that the devil's going to tempt us to think, oh, that guy's just crazy. Lord, I pray that these seeds that have been planted will take root, they will germinate, and they will spring forth into newness of life. Please, Lord, we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and may your names remain in the book of life.